On today's episode, join me and John Seasock as we discuss his legendary career and answer your fan questions. So strap yourselves in. Mash that loud pedal. And get ready. Because it's time to jam. Welcome back to the Monster Jam Weekly Podcast. My name is Jackson, also known as Monster Jam Historian. You can follow my social media at Monster Jam Historian on Instagram and Monster Jam Historian on YouTube. Today, I am very uh, happy and um, excited to be sitting down with the two-time Monster Jam World Finals Racing Champion, John Seasock. Thank you for coming on today's episode. Oh, man. Thanks for having me. It's an honor. So, I have some of my questions and fan questions that you guys on Instagram left me. I wanted to thank everyone for leaving those. So, I'm going to jump straight into my first question, uh, and that is, did you come up with the name Sudden Impact, and what was your thought process behind it, or why did you call it that? No, I, I didn't. Actually, I, got a, I bought a truck that was um, started, and that was the name on it. And, um, it just stayed, uh, we, then we trademarked it and, uh, ra- ran with it. And, um, you know, it seemed that it was really popular and, uh, everybody seemed to like it and stuff. So it, it took off really well and it, it kind of fit because, uh, like back in the day when you drove a steel body truck, you can put two cars in front of you and you couldn't see them until you hit them. So it kind of was like a, a sudden impact. So it just, it just kind of fit. That's awesome. I mean, my dad thought at first that it was based off the, uh, what was it, the Clint Eastwood movie, Sudden Impact. <laughs> yeah, the movie. <laughs> no, no. Um, yeah, that was a good movie, though. But uh, no, um, the truck was uh, was, be- was being built, and uh, um, I-, I guess it ran for a little bit, and then I, I was able to purchase it, and uh, um, it kind of took off from there. Yeah, it's been a it's been a long road. It went through a lot of different changes over the years. Well, speaking of changes, I wanted to ask, and a couple of other people did too. What was your favorite sudden impact design you drove? The original red, the one from two thousand, uh, the late nineties and two thousands, the one from two thousand two or two thousand three, or the uh, I think it was the blue and red one and yellow from two thousand and four. Yeah. Um, I like that body. I thought that looked pretty cool with the stars and stripes on it. Um, but, uh, I know I'm always pretty partial to the super duty to, um, the teal with the white on the nose and then the, the white rims with the teal on the outside of the rims. That one always seemed to, you know, cause that, has, that one has a special place in my heart. My next question for you is what was it like jumping ship from sudden impact to the Traxxas T-Max? Um, when we were, when I had the sudden impact, we were sponsored by Traxxas. So we were doing a lot of work with them and I've been an RC fanatic my whole life, you know, flying helicopters and planes and RC playing with RC trucks and cars and stuff. So, um, being part of that organization was awesome. And all the guys down there at Traxxas were just so cool to work with. Um, we would do displays at hobby stores and, um, me being a, a a hobbyist myself, I was able to, um, work in tune on everybody's cars and trucks. And, uh, and it was just a perfect fit. Um, the T-Max truck was just, it was so cool to drive and represent, um, you know, Traxxas. I liked, uh, I don't know how to explain this. I liked representing, uh, my sponsors. Um, it was something that, uh, I took great pride in and, and a lot of the sponsors that we had, um, like Traxxas or the Advanced Auto Parts Grinder, um, the people that were involved took ownership in that, and it was cool to be part of the, those families. Well, you kind of brought up something that I uh, was going to ask you, how you said that you take great pride in um, representing brands uh, such as in 2007 – that you're in a unique position driving arguably the most iconic superhero, Batman, and representing the huge 
comic brand, uh, DC Comics, uh, you brought up Advanced Auto Parts Grinder and uh, Traxxas T-Max, but what was it like driving Batman? Batman was a cool truck. I mean, it, the downside of it was the, the body was so expensive. You know, so I was always under pretty tight scrutiny of not screwing the body up. Um, but it, it, it looked so neat. It was different than everything else. Um, the, it's a little tighter because of the body, the cage and everything was a little bit more confined. Um, but to just to be part of the Batman, um, you know, history was, it was so neat. You know, we, we did a, we did a bunch of toy conventions and displays and, uh, the Batman truck was just so well received everywhere we went. It was, it was definitely a, an honor to be part of that. And I think it would have been an even bigger honor uh, in uh, 2007 and 2008. What was it like not only beating Dennis Anderson for the racing championship in 2007, no, I can't speak, <laughs> in 2007, <laughs> but repeating your success and defending your racing world title a year later in 2008? Um, a dream come true. You know, uh, you always, no matter what anybody does, uh, you always want to be the best at what you can do. And um, to be the best, you got to beat the best. The everything was clicking. I mean, my crew guys get all the credit. You know, they they work so hard to get in that truck, uh, 110 percent, and uh, you know, keeping me calm in between rounds and giving me the information I needed, and uh, just making sure the truck was right as we went and went and went. Um, you know, it was it's something I I can I can relive the whole thing right now. I mean, I, it's something I never forget and. When I found out that I won a championship, I didn't know what to do. You know, you work all your life to for that point in life, and then when it happens, it's like, e oh boy, now what? <laughs> um, so I started I started doing donuts <laughs> I did, until I until I had a game plan. I sat there and spun into donuts in the middle of the field, and uh, I'm like, okay, I guess I got to get out now. And um, it just was such a big blur because, uh, you know, it was, it was a dream come true. Um, I come from a small town that, in the coal region in Pennsylvania, and uh, I'm very proud of where I'm from. And, and but it's just five thousand people in my town, and um, there was back in the day, all the years of working up to that point, and my friends and family that supported me, and fans and people helping and everything. It was just um, it, it was just amazing, and and the Vegas experience is just phenomenal. They out there. Um, the fan, the, the meet and greets, the fans, uh, you know, my pockets are loaded with good luck charms and, you know, I, I, I had a t-shirt on from Afghanistan. I mean, it just was the whole experience was, it's hard to even put in words. It was a dream come true. The, the second one, I didn't even know I won. Um, I'm sitting up in a truck and, um, you know, they're saying, okay, you won. I'm like, okay, cool. Who, what, what lane do we have next? And they're Cody's yelling at me. He's like, no, you won. I'm like, okay, I get it. You know, what lane do I have to go on? He's like, no, get out of the truck. You're the champion. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, I was so focused on making my passes down the track, hitting my marks um, that I didn't even know we won the, the championship. And, uh, you know, I was glad it happened because we could have made another round, but the transmission was so hot. Um, you know, it just, uh, you know, I didn't even know we won until we won. And uh, I actually um, watched, uh, it was a clip that came up on YouTube. I think, I'm not sure who it was. I think it was either, it was definitely either Ken Stout or Scott Douglas. But one of them said that in 2007, you were the one that made the most um, passes that night. And yeah. that it yeah. paid off. Yeah, um, I wanted it right, you know, and it, I, I, everything was just clicking, you know, we, uh, the truck was working phenomenal. The guys were on top of it. The, uh, the crew, I mean, we have the easiest part. We hold the steering wheel. The crew guys deserve a lot more credit than they get. And, uh, you see my, my crew, like now Cody being a, a champion and stuff. It's, it's so proud to see, see that happening. Um, but it, I was just making practices. I wanted to make sure I had everything right. Um, not all 
not all the not all not every, not everybody plays by the same rules. Um, you have to get down the track, but you, don't, you know, gearing's a big issue. Uh, I, I wasn't able to get the gearing that I wanted, so we had to make do with what we had. Uh, so we did different things with with the uh, limiting straps and uh, the toe in on the on the tie rods and stuff like that. Just little tricks here and there that I thought would help us. And we were trying to practice and trying as we were going, and it, and it paid off. You were one of the four drivers to be signed to drive the People's Truck Advanced Water Parts Grinder. You kind of brought it up before, um, but what was it like representing a truck with an even bigger sponsor behind you? That was fantastic. Everybody that was involved in that whole program, everybody at Monster Jam and the marketing team, all the Advanced Auto Parts team, the the audio video people that were part of I mean, advance was just great to be part of. And it, it broke my heart to see that, that go away. Um, cause that was such a good thing. And it meant so much to so many people, um, everywhere we would go, all the stores we were, we would do displays in, or if we went to the distribution centers and everybody had ownership in that truck, you know, it, it was the people's truck. It was all the employees, you know, throughout the country that worked for advanced auto parts. It, it, uh, it was such a great team and a great honor and, and, and so much fun. I mean, I got to do so much cool things with that sponsorship, um, different videos we had a chance to do and uh, visit Wooden Warriors down in Texas and San Antonio and uh, just everything about it. You know, even to this day, when I go in advanced auto parts, people recognize me as a, the grand, one of the grander drivers. That's just amazing to hear um especially the story behind it i mean really um you know i only knew about the um what's the word i'm looking for like the the fact that it was called the people's truck and that was that was just based off what what um scott douglas and all the other commentators said at that time but for you to really go out and say that that it was it really was the people's truck that it was for the employees and the marketing team and all that stuff. That's just, oh, it, and, and it was, it was the, um, I was, I was called the people's champion, which to me, that, that was, that meant so much to me to be tagged that line. And then to be able to, to go into what was called the people's truck. Um, and, uh, just the interaction with everybody, the, the employees at advanced auto parts and who, uh, uh, I mean, there was times I, I was in Texas at doing a, um, a meet and greet at an advanced auto parts store. And I w- it was supposed to start at, at one o'clock, um, or I mean two o'clock and my, I flew in late. My crew called me and like, man, you need to get over here. And it was like 12, 12 o'clock. I said, well, what's wrong? He said, they're lined up around the building. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. I thought they were joking. And I got there as soon as I could. So I left the plane. I got in a rental car and got over right away. And, uh, it was, they were lined around the inside of the store, um, out the door, down the sidewalk and down the back of the, of the building. The fans were lined up. Wow. And uh, so we, uh, yeah, it was crazy. I'm like, so you know, we started right away. And, uh, the manager came over and said, man, you're not supposed to do this until two. Or I said, yeah, but you know, these people are waiting here and you know, I'm, I'm starting now. And so we, and it was like that for two hours longer than it was supposed to be. Um, but I mean, I, I've got a lot of great friends and a lot of people that I respect and admire, but there's nobody out there that I really want an autograph from. So if somebody wants my autograph, it, it blows me away that anybody would. And, I feel that they deserve 110% of my attention while they're getting that. If, if that makes any sense, you know, it's, um, I'm flattered that anybody would ever want my autograph. And I always want to make sure that it was always immense. It wasn't just like a signature and here you go. I always wanted to, you know, try to make it special. And, uh, yeah, I remember that, that display, it was just crazy. You know, it was just nonstop and people lined up outside the building. And it was funny. It, it was just, it was hilarious. It, um, it was a, a magical experience. That's insane that they lined that far back, and the commitment that you that you were like, ah, it's supposed to start in two hours. We'll just start now. You know, that's that is, is 
No, I can't speak. <laughs> that is dedication, <laughs> you know, because, you know, well, a lot of... Sorry to cut you off. I know a lot of other motorsports people will probably be like, well, I don't want to be here longer than I want to be. But, you know, the fact that you're, that you're dedicated to your fans, you go that extra mile where, you, where you're like, I don't care if I'm here longer than I'm supposed to be. If these fans want my autograph, then I'll, I'll give it to them and not just, you know do uh um you know like as you said you make it special you make it like you make it worth their time like if they've been waiting there for like two hours you give like a two hours worth signature if that makes any sense yeah i mean it, it you know times are hard and people work hard for their money and they could spend it anywhere and then if they choose to come out and see us for two two and a half hours i mean it, it's an honor for us to be able to perform for them and they deserve to have the utmost attention. Um, you know, I mean, so unfortunately sometimes mechanical things break and things happen and not everything goes the way you have planned. But in my mind, or in my opinion, you know, that I'm honored that anybody would want to come see me. I'm honored that anybody would ever ask my autograph. I'm honored that you asked me to be part of the podcast. Um, you know, it's just, I'm the same guy everybody went to school with. I just got the chance to drive a big truck and travel around the world a couple of times. All right, John, my final question before we hopefully can get into the fan questions. It, the Out of the fan questions is, out of Sudden Impact, Traxxas T-Max, Batman, Grinder, and the few other trucks you have driven, what was your favorite truck and why? Ooh, um, <laughs> that one's hard. Every truck has its own personality um and not, not necessarily the body like you could build 10 chassis in a row and each one's going to work 10 different ways um so sudden impact was the first so that that means a lot to me batman is the one who won the championships and it's batman i mean that's how can you beat that um the grinder was so much fun representing advanced auto parts um, the Traxxas T-Max, you know, representing Traxxas and being an RC fanatic. I mean, that was a, a win-win, you know, um, hanging out in hobby stores all around the country and stuff and playing with RC stuff. Um, you know, I, I drove Gravedigger over in the, over in Europe with, for the BBC with my Batman fire suit on. Um, that was fun. Yeah. Uh, I filled in from a couple of other drivers here and there and, um, yeah, I guess every every one, every experience, every trip, every every place I went always had meant something to me. Yeah, you know, I always took something home from it. So it's hard to say. I can't say which one would be my favorite. I would say I thank God for every second I had to have that experience and and ha- you know that, to be able ha- to be able to have that. It just I know that's not a really good answer, but it's kind of the best I got at the present moment. No, but I, but it makes sense though, to me in my mind, like you say that it's, that it's, you know, it's, um, not a good answer, but you, you know, it may not be what people were, uh, wanting to hear or, or expecting to hear. But I think that it's, that it's true though, is that you've driven so many trucks and that each one is different and they all hold a different, I mean, from what we talked about before, they all meant different things to you. That Sudden Impact was the place that got you started, that you loved and you still love RC cars, and that meant a lot to you. Obviously, Batman was your world champ, uh, championship truck, and as he said, it's Batman. And then you drove the people's truck, Grinder, and, then, and you said that that was an awesome experience too. So in my mind, it makes sense. You know, it, it's, it's funny cause it's, uh, it's very surreal. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm the oldest of six kids and, you know, I didn't come from a rich family. We built a truck in my dad's driveway and, um, to, I remember leaving to go to New York and I told my dad I, I had to go to New York to, to race. And, he asked, well, when are you leaving? I said, I'm going to leave Friday night. The race is Saturday. And he's like, Friday night? You're not going to make it in time. Because according to him, he thought New York was, if you went past the state line, you'd fall off the face of the earth. You know, the, it was, everything was so far away. And, uh, um, you know, I remember leaving 
my area and, and performing and then going a little farther, going a little farther and then walking into the Astrodome for the first time and um, seeing that and stuff. Like it was just, everything is just so surreal. We're uh, a dream and a, a fantasy has taken me, you know, and we get asked all the time, like, what was your favorite place? Every place, you know, every place I went, I, um, I, I tried to see the culture and see how people live and, um, and, and just try to understand. And it makes me appreciate what I have around here more than uh, most people would. You know, I, I live in a small town, which is very cool. And um, there's waterfalls and bear that run around and deer and everything. And um, the one thing I found out, of the, of the, probably the, big, the most educational thing I found out of this whole experience I had was you, you can make it wherever you're at. You know, um, where I live. Everybody says you got to get out of here and go to New York City. Um, so if you go to New York City, everybody says you got to leave New York City and go in the country. You go to London, they say you got to go to New York City. Everybody thinks you have to be someplace else than where you're at. Um, and I think if people stopped and actually looked and you know just kind of looked around where they're at, they'd be surprised of some of the things they might be missing. It it, it amazes me that anybody would wait in an autograph line to to, to meet me. Like it just totally blows me away. Um, it's hard to comprehend that. And um, I think that's what makes certain drivers different from other people, you know, um, not other people, but different from other drivers. It, you know, there's ones that, Hey, you know, look at me. I'm a, I'm a monster truck driver. And then there's the ones that, you know, you look at, like what I look at it as you know, for two and a half hours, I get to play in a fantasy world. Um, and then after that, I'm like everybody else. I have to go out and work um, in the in the yard. I gotta pay bills. I gotta cut grass. I, you know, you know, it's it, it's um, two different. There's a fantasy world that we get to play in for two hours, and then there's the real world that we live in. That where everybody's the same. Um, you know, I have friends that are rock stars, and you know, my one buddy called me and he's like, "What are you doing?" I said, "I'm just gonna go up to the camper and hang out at a campfire for a weekend." And, so what are you doing? He's like, I'm out in the horse barn shoveling horse crap. They don't show that on MTV Cribs, do they? <laughs> I'm like, no, you know, it's it's, it's funny because it's no matter who you are, it, life isn't that much different for people. You know, it. everybody has a job. It's just their jobs are a little different. And my, my, and I, I was lucky enough to be blessed with my job being holding a steering wheel. And driving a, a monster truck. I mean, that that that's a that's a dream job <laughs> it, it, it's I, well, for me it, is. <laughs> well, it was a, a definitely a dream come true i uh i worked at a, an auto parts store here in town and i would get laughed at and teased all the time and um you know i, I remember all that i remember the good i remember the bad i my grandmother was one of my biggest supporters, and until the day that she passed away, she was, she'd be, she would at the nursing home, she'd be yelling at the TV. They made her put, she made them put on Monster Jam. Um, that was TNN back then. That's when I was fighting with uh, Tom Menz all the time on TV, and she would be yelling at the TV, screaming and carrying on, and it, it was just, it, was, it was so much. It just was funny, but uh, um, you know. I, the support of the fans and the, my everybody has just meant so much to me. Uh, I mean, I'm speechless. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> I can't speak. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't have words. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, <laughs> oh my I can't believe I've been doing this for so long. I still can't speak. My God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Actually, I think it's kind of funny. Sorry, <laughs> I just think it's hilarious. What, what's hilarious? Sorry, <laughs> that you, you're out of words. <laughs> I just think that's funny. No, that's that's that's. Uh, sometimes I laugh at myself. That I, you know, when I go back and edit and I say a word, I'm like, how did I stuff that up? Like sometimes I say the, and then it comes out as like, Bleh. I'm like, oh well. <laughs> oh how man, is that possible? dude, if, if you went back and saw the the blooper videos I made. <laughs> I mean, there was, there was reels of me acting like an idiot, you know, <laughs> and just messing everything up. There's, there's probably great bloopers of 
of all, all of the, oh my god there's probably good bloopers of all of the drivers out there oh yeah 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 some of them we did on purpose sometimes i mean we yeah there was a lot of behind the scenes stuff that was just funny you know um that was just hilarious but that, and that was good about advanced auto parts because we were always doing videos um you're you're down in australia um do you know what the alamo is uh it sounds familiar Okay, it's kind of, it's a pretty big thing here in the states. We were doing a <laughs> we're we're in San Antonio. Uh, we were going to go visit, visit the Wounded Warriors, and uh, we were shooting a shooting a part of the video at the Alamo, and I almost got arrested <laughs> because the the film crew didn't have permits to shoot the video on a, on a, at the, at the Alamo. Um, so I had to talk my way out of this and stand on the, in the sidewalk and I off the sidewalk in a curb to try to, and I was harassing the cop as we were doing it, um, to be able to shoot this video. And I'm like, great, man, we're going to get arrested. I don't even get the chance to race, you know, <laughs> get locked up by Gazi Osborne at the Alamo. Um, but that, that's like, that was just funny. You know, there, we were, uh, back in the day, uh, Actually, we were just talking about this the other other week. With TNN, we had a we were racing in Indianapolis, and that's back when it's sudden impact, and we were going down to Orlando. So the TV crew hopped in my rig. Um, they were going to spend a week with me on the road. So I had to. I was all mic'd up and everything, and I had a producer in the passenger seat. The cameraman was in the bunk of my tractor, so I drove the tractor trailer by myself. And we left the RCA dome in Indianapolis. Went two blocks and got pulled over by the police. We like we we didn't even start the trip. I'm they're they're arresting somebody on the corner and I was looking at them and not paying attention. I took a tractor trailer down a one way street to a, a eleven foot bridge where I wouldn't fit underneath. The cop comes walking up and the I'm mic'd live. The TV cameras was shooting a picture of me off the mirror back at me at the cop yelling at me and um it was just it was just hilarious to, you know that was a really good blooper tape because there's no way that would ever be able to be edited i mean <laughs> to be but it it just like funny stories like that there was just so much good stuff that happened going down the road with the the friends and fans and um i mean that's how we started with the hospital visits you know it was going down the road and uh, instead of hanging out in the, in the parking lot, I started visiting hospitals and visiting sick kids, and, and now it's a, a huge thing. Okay, John, so now that's the end of my questions. I have some of the fan questions, and just before I ask this first one, thank you to everyone who did leave a question. Uh, Randino129 asks, John, do you miss Scott and Andy from the Aurora Body... No, I can't speak. Body Shop. Oh, yes, very much. Um, Scott is still my brother and always will be my brother. Um, and, and Andy, uh, you know, we, I haven't talked to Andy in a while, um, but I get a chance to talk to Scott fairly often. And the, the bond that we all made back then, I mean, I, I'm going to just going to shoot this out there. The talent of the drivers right now is phenomenal. The guys are, and girls are amazing, the things that they're doing. Um, but the bad part is they're never going to have a chance to experience the family that we had making this thing grow. Um, the dirt crew, the track crew, the you know, marketing, the all the people that, all the players that made this whole thing come together. And the body guys, like Scott and Andy, um, you know, if Scott called me right now and said, hey, John, I am in trouble. I need your right arm. I would cut it off with a dull butter knife and I would drive it there for him. Um, you know, it's that kind of friendship. And it's something that I'll take to my grave. You know, I miss them guys a lot. Love them to death. Nolan Davis 88 wants to know, out of all of the world finals you've driven in, what was the best freestyle course? Ooh. Um... I would have to. That's. A, I'm gonna answer it in two parts. Okay. I think if it was one of the earlier courses, with us having the experience that we had 
10 years into it. Okay. And let me explain that one. Um, cause it might not make a whole lot of sense. I, I think uh, that they screwed up by putting so much crap out on the floor that it's, it was hard to navigate and hard to do good things. So I, I think, I think all the drivers are there for a reason. They all have skills that are phenomenal. Um, and I don't think you have to put a lot of obstacles on the floor to make a driver look whole. I think if you give them an, enough space where they can actually show off and drive and do wheelies and get the big air and get their runs and drift and everything, I think that makes a much better show. Um, so I think the in the beginning of it, it wasn't as busy on the floor. Um, but I don't think our skill level was to the point, if we were able to have our skill level way up now, back when it wasn't so much stuff on the floor, I think it, that'd be my favorite. I don't, that, does that make sense? Yeah, sort of. And I, I find that very interesting. No one has really brought, brought that up and it, and it makes like, it, it makes sense. Like, I'm not just saying that to agree with you. Like it genuinely makes sense because our world finals, they they kind of do now, especially they clutter it with with jumps with, with crap and yeah <laughs> and I mean the best example is World Finals 15 where they where someone just went mad with the dirt and had like jumps that were like two feet apart, um not exactly but you know what I mean and mm -hmm. you saw drivers like Dennis Anderson who just sent it and then nosedived and then that was. <clears throat> that was it. And that was yeah, and then a lot of other drives didn't exactly do that, but they See, that was always did the same thing. Like my biggest complaint was like we're supposed to be the best at what we do. Well, let us be the best that we that we are. Um, you know, give us a normal track, and let us show the fans and 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 cut us loose and let us do what we do best. You know, you don't need to make a steep ramp or a. Um, you know, a, a whole bunch of obstacles out there, you know, make a normal truck, a track where you, a person can drive it and let us show off. That's what we do best. I mean, our Eagles are bigger than the trucks we drive, you know, so let us go out there and show off like we, like we, we should. Um, I mean, the right drivers, that's it's People always ask you, oh, what's, you know, what's your favorite stadiums or arenas? Um, and the one is I, I love driving my truck. So it wouldn't matter where it was at. Stadiums are cool because you get big air. Arenas are awesome because you can see who can drive a truck and who can't. An arena will make it'll make a, a man or a boy. I mean, you'll see right away um, who can handle the truck, who can drive it, and who can put a, a show on that makes you stand on your feet. Um, and I always loved that about arenas, you know, because it's it was just more personal, it was smaller, and you can see who can drive and who really can't. I think to me. It, being a good driver is more than just um, aiming and pulling the trigger. You know, um, there's a uh, there's a, a finesse and a technique to driving, not just aiming for something and standing on it. Definitely, and I think a, a kind of track that I don't know if you've seen it, John, but one of my favorite tracks that I think that they should definitely do um, if the All Star Challenge is happening this year. And definitely for future world finals, they should do the Saturday um, All Star track. That was new, but that wasn't cluttered with jumps. I was very surprised because they had the racing. I think it was because they did it in the same night, like how they used to do it. Instead of doing it spread over when they did the three day, two day thing, the 32 trucks where they had okay, here's a specifically designed racing course, and then come back the next day and it's designed for freestyle. They had racing and freestyle to do. And so, because racing, you can't necessarily do it with jumps left, right, and center. They made a basic yet effective track design. And, I, and we saw some great freestyles because of that. And it was just... You know, it was it. I've said this before um, that it felt like a mini world finals. It felt like one of the ones from not exactly, but sort of like from two thousand four, two thousand five, or something like that. And mm -hmm. I think that they should definitely 
incorporate that kind of track style to their future world finals. I'm not sure what you think about that or if you've seen the track at all. I didn't I didn't see that track, but uh um I think they I think I mean not that my opinion means anything, but if I had a given opinion, it would be have more faith in the drivers. And I don't you don't have to make it cluttered. You don't have to put a million jumps out there. Um you don't have to put we can get wheelies off a off a speed bump. You know, so if the right driver is driving the, the truck and it's set up the right way, you can do phenomenal things with these vehicles. Um, and I think by adding a lot of different stuff on the track, it takes away the opportunity for that to happen. Um, but that's just that's just my opinion. I mean, it, I could be wrong. But it, it you know, you it's it's kind of true though. You know, it's like you said, it's you know, if you want to do a wheelie, you don't have to have like a giant seven foot jump designed for a wheelie, no. you just need like a, you know, like a speed bump. Like, sure, yeah. the seven foot jump is going to look cool, but you don't need it there. It's not needed to do a wheelie, you know. Yeah, and and, and it's anybody could bounce it up into a wheelie. You know, it, it's there's there's a technique to doing things, and I like to see uh, the technical side. You know, like getting big air and stuff is cool, but, um, you know, it's, there's more, I, I want to see somebody drive a truck. You know, I don't want to see somebody just aim at stuff and stand on the throttle and hope that it works out. Okay. Yeah. You know, right. I want to see good saves. I want to see, uh, all that stuff. Technical and calculated. Yeah. You know, like we would sit down and plan in our heads, like we would walk the track all the time and get an idea and a game plan um of what you're gonna do and you know i didn't have a plan b and a plan c because you might take a bad bounce and then you gotta change your plan again um and then maybe halfway through just throw everything out the window you know um but you try to have an idea or try to have a plan and um i was always like being more of a, a technical type of driver so moving on to my next question, alcoholic underscore beverage wants to know, did you prefer driving independently or with the backing of Feld? Um, they both had pros and cons. Um, independently, it was all out of my pocket. Uh, and... I worked on the truck and drove the truck trailer, uh, did the marketing, did everything. Um, the backing with Feld was fun, but then I also, you're under their scrutiny. You know, um, you know, the owning my truck, I drove it the way I wanted to. Um, I didn't have a million dollar budget, so I would have to roll the dice and pick and choose my battles. Um, and the, I guess the bad part would be people thought that since you worked for monster jam or drove one of their trucks, you could go out and destroy it and do whatever you wanted to do. And, and that wasn't the case. There was drivers that were able to have a green light whenever they wanted to. Um, but there was a lot of us that weren't, uh, so, you know, you had rules you had to follow. Um, so there's pros and cons of both of them. All right, uh, Brandon underscore uh, Sim, Sim? Sorry, I can't say your last name. Sorry, buddy. Uh, what was your favorite race against uh, a driver? Um, Dan Runty, Bigfoot, Indianapolis, Prom T race. Um, I don't know the year, but... We we got there to Indianapolis and we raced some Pro MT and it turns out it was gonna be a figure eight course. So uh nothing but love and respect for Dan and all the Bigfoot guys and stuff and love being with them and Dan and I lined up and I lost by like a hundred thousandths of a second. Um basically a pebble tripped the light. <laughs> off my tire it was that close of a race wow and we got out of the truck and we didn't know who won and we we're hugging each other jumping up and down because it was such a fun fun race and i remember we were getting interviewed and you know dan and i have our arms around each other and 
uh, the guy's like, who won? We're like, we don't know. And they're like, don't you care? And we're like, no. It, 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 who cares if you lose a race like that? You know, I'll lose a race like that all day because um, it was just so much fun. Um, and and, that, and that's what it was all about was the, yeah, yeah you race because you want to win, but there's other ways of winning besides being the first one across the finish line, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I mean, wow, it was that close. Like, holy dooly. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, it was <clears throat> amazing. Like, it it was like a rock that fell off the tire that happened to trip to I mean, it was so close. Um, and it was so much fun. I'm not but, in, you know... Oh. You, Sorry, I'll let you finish. You don't want to, you don't want to, you never want to lose. But if you have to lose, that's the way to do it. Definitely, I might actually go look for look for that after this is done. Um, mm-hmm. Cut underscore draws underscore stuff wants to know between your, oh sorry, uh, between your back to back world racing titles, uh, two thousand seven two thousand eight, which one meant more to you? Uh. Hmm. Well, the first one meant a lot because it's the first one. Um, the second one meant a lot because it showed that the first one wasn't a, a fluke. Um, the first one had such sentimental values um, because of the fans and, um, and all the little uh, good luck charms that we carried. The second one meant a lot because we had a special guest there for Make a Wish. Um, and uh, did you ever see the tribute video that they made for me for the, the Batman from out there in Vegas? Um, uh, I think it's uh, it's I think if you if you Google John Seesaw tribute video or something, um, uh, it's a the Batman truck and Make a Wish and everything. Um, but there's a gentleman in there who's um, he's taped up pretty bad uh, for Make a Wish. Basically, his name is Josh, and he was burnt in a fire, and we flew him out to Vegas and. Uh, his there's in a video you'll see him sitting and then you'll see him walking. Well, that when he was walking, that was my surprise. That was the first time he walked since his accident, and he was doing that for me. Um, and he walked over to my truck and sat in my director's chair, and uh, you know, everybody's crying and stuff. And I I'm not the sharpest pencil in the box all the time. Um, I told him I said, man, you did this for me. I'm gonna win this race for you tonight not realizing I just promised to win the world championship and I'm an idiot. You know, <laughs> it's hard enough win in a regular race, let alone winning a world championship. Uh, but thank God I did win that night. And when I jumped in the stands to be with the fans, I happened to jump in right where he was at by accident. So that experience um, means a lot to me. I, I can't watch that video without getting teary eyed to this day. Um, and I've watched that video it's a, a three doors down song called let me be myself. And, um, it, I get choked up watching the video every time. It's just, uh, an amazing phenomenal experience. Wow. That's, I, I do remember seeing some make, a, I think it was in the trailer for the world finals nine dvd i remember seeing you with with some make a wish person i'm not sure if that's entirely who you were talking about um but man that's just again i'm speechless (laughs) (laughs) dude there's been there's so many there's so many behind the backs backstage stories that nobody even ever hears about you know um after the first World Finals, uh, I went to Stafford Springs, Connecticut, and there was a, a family, the O'Connor family. They came up to me with a bottle of champagne, and uh, they said they don't care what anybody says. They felt that I was a real world champion and gave me a bottle of champagne, and they autographed it. And uh, I said, you know what? When I do win, so I'm going to come back, and we're going to drink this together. 
So I took that bottle of champagne home and I put it on my one of my trophy cases. And for 10 years, every time I walked in the house, I saw that bottle. Um, you know, uh, I won the championship. And I made a promise to this family I was going to share this champagne with them. So I had um, some friends of mine at Monster Jam help me track down his family. We went up to Stafford Springs, and after the race, we pulled them down out of the, out of the stands. Um, they came down on the on the track with me, and I and I was with the help of the announcer, Joe Lowe. I said, you know, I made a promise ten years ago that if I well, when I won, we were going to share the champagne, and uh, I'm the I'm the world reigning champion. So. <laughs> We cracked that open and drank it, you know, and um, it, was, it, it meant a lot because one, you know, if you, you, things happen in life, but if you make a promise, you, you should always try to keep your promise. Um, and that was one that I wanted to try to keep that was very, it meant a lot to me. And uh, it was just a, a neat experience too to, to be able to do that. But um and it was funny because that night too, there was I was driving Blue Thunder, Tom was driving Maximum Destruction, and uh, Dennis was there with um, Digger, and all three of us tied for thirties in freestyle. Was <laughs> uh, we at the place they had one heck of a show that night, <laughs> but after it was all done, we um, cracked open that bottle of champagne in front of all the fans, and I kept my promise. Does I'm <laughs> still speechless? My God, I sh- I should just call this I'm speechless with. John say so because I am at a loss of words. Um, what was okay? Raiders fan three one seven nine says, "Will you ever come back to compete? Because we miss you." I would love to come back and compete, and I miss you guys more than you could possibly imagine. Um, I I would love to be behind the wheel of a truck again. Um. And you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, I, I won't be driving a Monster Jam truck. I know that. But uh, you, you never know what can happen, you know. And um, I would love to be back out there again. You could bring back – no, I can't speak. You could bring back Sudden Impact. That'd be cool. <laughs> yeah, that'd be cool. It's, it's, um, that would be very cool. Uh, my – youngest son actually bought my old chassis. Um, so the very my... first one that you had, he bought? Uh, no, the one that was a Super Duty, the one that used to be the liquidator. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know um, what you mean now. He, he bought that chassis. So uh, I, have a, I, have a, I have a big shop here now we run a business out of, and um, he's going to bring that up there, and we're going to redo that truck for him. Um, and I, with the only stipulation that I'm going to drive it because <laughs> the way we're going to build it, I'm not going to drive it. So, um, but yeah, it's that's in the works, and we're going to build some other stuff too at our shop. But um, to answer your question, yeah, I would love to drive again, and there's not a day that goes by that I don't miss the fans. Uh, Jean Jean Carlo Puccio, I'm sorry if I butchered that wants to know why did you start driving monster trucks why um okay i'll give you the g version of the whole thing (laughs) uh i live in a small town and i come from a very big family i'm the oldest of six uh we didn't have a lot of money growing up my mom and dad worked hard um i had an old beat up truck that I bought off my dad and I, I jacked it up and at night we would sit in a parking lot and all the guys would get together and we would cruise the town or, um, just sit there and then shoot the crap all night talking. Um, I would, as we were cruising, um, my buddies had all had fast Camaros and cars and stuff and they'd be sitting there bragging how fast their stuff is. Well, the girls would flag me down and say, Hey, it's go." for a ride it's well four wheel and get the truck muddy and stuff um so it, it all started with, with girls that was pretty much the main reason <laughs> it was because of girls and and then the trucks just got bigger and bigger um a, a funny story is uh 
uh, a, fr- a good friend of mine, and he actually was on Jeopardy, the TV show, and uh, um, monster trucks were down at the Spectrum in Philadelphia. So him and another friend and myself, we went and asked his mom if we could borrow the car to go to the mall, her car. And she said, yeah. So after a little bit of persuading, so we took her car and went to the mall, but it was the mall in Philadelphia, which was two hours away. So we could go see the monster trucks at the spectrum. Um, so we drove through the parking lot of the mall. Just so we didn't lie that we actually went to a mall, it just wasn't the mall that she thought we were going to and saw, saw the monster trucks. And, uh, that's why I met Bob Chandler and, uh, it all started there. That's that's awesome, um, especially the fact that you started because of the girls. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> What's the truth? I mean, I, I it, it's all about girls. It seems like that's what makes the world go around. That's what makes my dad's world go around. Anyway, um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Dad. If you're listening to this, he probably is. Anyway, um, Ainsley announcer wants to know. Besides the world championships, what was your favorite show or moment from your career? I know we've kind of talked a, a bit briefly about that, but do you want to name something else? Um, God, you have to narrow that down a little bit. Um, I've had so many, I've been blessed with so many different opportunities and so many things that, um, it's just phenomenal. Uh, I I was racing a Wildwood one year, and Todd Frolic and I got tangled up, and Todd rolled. Um, he says I ran into him. I say he ran into me. Um, either way, he rolled over, and I stopped to get out to make sure he was okay. Um, so I didn't win the race because I, I ended up winning by default, but I didn't win because I didn't cross the finish line. It was more important for me to make sure he was okay. And my oldest son came up to me and said that that was so cool that I did that. And, uh, and that's when I started saying, you know, there's other ways of winning besides being the first one across the finish line. You know, Todd's more important to me than a trophy. Um, and it's that sticks in my head forever. You know, that was an experience that, um, you know, to have my son say that to me meant, meant the world to me. Um, doing stuff with, uh, I learned how to do sign language so I could speak to kids. And, um, there's some pictures of me signing with some, some fans and, uh, that, that, is a, uh, that experience is, is huge. Um, beating Tom Mintz, taking he was like in a, on a 38 round winning streak, and I took him out in Houston and, and ended his streak. And I think all the drivers were more excited than I was, you know, because nobody, nobody was able to beat Tom at that time. And I, and I, that away from him, and that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, uh, I, I don't know. There's just there's so many memories that just take my breath away all the time and that you can't narrow uh, it down to one as well no i really can't i mean that every time i left the house every time i drove the truck going down the road or you know watching the sunrise and over the desert or um you know waking up in germany and um you know being on stage with kiss or three doors down or i mean every there's so many opportunities that I've been blessed with because of the monster trucks. And I think, I mean, I'm by no means a saint, but I, when I wake up in the morning, I don't get out of bed till I say a prayer and I don't go to bed at night. Till I say my prayers and, and my prayers include thanking God for all these opportunities and these blessings because yeah, there was so many opportunities that I've been blessed with. I mean, it, it, so many things that just amaze me, you know, we, um, are, you, are you familiar with the Beads of Courage? Do you uh, know what that is? No, I don't, sadly. Okay. Um, so the some of the hospitals have these things called Beads of Courage. So every time um, if a, a kid had a uh, went through another, a special treatment, he would get like a, a little monster truck tire on his bead, and that meant, that meant one thing, and then like a lightning bolt meant another, and 
you know, and you had your name on them and, and myself and the other drivers had our own beats of courage. Uh, we were in Denver and we're in the hospital and um, a lady came over and, and she's like, oh my God, she said, my, son, my son's a big fan of yours. I said, oh great, you know, where's he at? And she said that he's upstairs, he's not allowed to come down, that he's not going to make it. He only has a couple weeks to live. Uh, you know, I'm like, oh, oh my God, I said, do you want me to go see him? She's like, well, can you? I'm like, yeah, you know, what are they going to do, stop me? <laughs> you know, I'm going to go, you want me there, I'm going to be there, and that's it. And uh, I went up in his room, and I was talking to the kid and everything, and uh, he had his beads of courage on and stuff, and he, he, I asked him if there was anything I could do, and he wanted to be buried with my necklace on. Um, yeah, so I, I took his necklace off and I put mine on him and I, I wore his and, um, you know, what do you, what do you say to people? You know, how, you know, it, it, it's hard to put in words, something like that, you know, that, that somebody wants to be buried with something. I mean, and, and the kid was so upbeat and positive and, uh, um, the mom was trying to hold it together and stuff and, you know, that to be able to be part of an experience like that, you know, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing. You know, it's, um, yeah, now my, now it's my turn to stutter. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to put it in words to the emotional roller coaster that is the, you know, what do you say when somebody wants to do something like that? I mean, besides, obviously you say yes, cause there's no way you could turn them down, but, um, to have that kind of influence on somebody is, is pretty amazing. I guess is, is the right word to say. Yeah, I mean, if, if you can't put it into words, I certainly can't. Yeah, um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I wish I had a, a way of saying it. I mean, we visit the hospitals to the point where I would be able to scrub down and go into the terminal wards and... Yeah, everybody's thanking me. Like, oh, thank you for doing this. I'm like, well, you know, I, they get so I get so much back. I mean, I I can never give them as much as they give me. Um, I have a, a, a friend. I can't even call him a fan. He's a friend. Um, my buddy Connor, out in California, and we've been friends since we we're since he was four. You know, he wasn't supposed to make it, and he's 16 now, and the kid's amazing, and um. If you ever go on my Facebook page, you always see pictures of Connor and I in his, in his wheelchair, and um, you know we'd be arguing about different things. And he he would always, even to the, like to this day, he knows when I'm having a bad day, and he'll call me out of the blue and make me realize that I need to suck it up, <laughs> you know, and go on because life could be so much worse. Um, you know, it, the fans, you know, I guess God blessed me with an opportunity to to connect with these fans on a different level um you know we've i've done a lot with uh, down syndrome and stuff and where parents are like they you know getting hugs off of kids and the parents are like they don't, he don't touch nobody and I said, well, you know that's i'm on the same wavelength you know <laughs> maybe he's probably a little bit higher iq than i do um but we're able to to bond and uh the shittles experiences is something that you know, I can't thank God enough for. Still, still no, I know I'm, I'm getting, I'm turning sappy. I don't mean to be so sappy, but, um, no, I mean, it, it comes from the heart though, you know, so it, it, it's a hundred percent from my heart. It's, you know, I remember standing on top of the, the tire for introductions, like in the Georgia dome, with 72,000 people and having tears in my eyes because, I'm on top of a monster truck tire in the Georgia Dome with 72,000 people, you know, um, living a dream. Uh, you know, it's just, it, I, I had a chance to live my dreams. And it was all because of all the fans. And that's the only reason I had that chance was because of the fans. And I never, never forgot that. And, and they kept you going throughout the, through, no, I can't speak, throughout your career. Yeah. Yeah, the, the if there wasn't for fans, we wouldn't be there. Um, and that's one thing that when I, when any new drivers I talk to, and they ask me what's the key, I'm like, you just make sure you don't forget where you came from. You know, these fans are here; they can spend their money anywhere. 
they're here to see you, so you give them the time. Definitely. Um, Cora Solera wants to know, how hard was the landing of the pogo you did at World Finals 4? I know a lot of trucks back then weren't really built to handle an impact, pun intended, like that back then. Um, the pogo on the nose, um, over the garbage truck. Yep. Was that the one? Um, that wasn't too, too bad. I mean, it, it, it was, uh, I was a little black and blue. Like you were able to see where my harness was on my shoulders and stuff. Um, the year, I think it was 2005. I did a pogo. The last show at the Silverdome, um, I did a, a, a pogo in T-Max, and that put the frame rails right down through the dirt into the concrete. Um, that, when I took off my shirt, you can see exactly where my harness was. That that one was hard. <laughs> that one hurt. Uh, but I remember the one in the gar- over the garbage truck in Vegas, and that it was a little scary at the time, but um, I, I do stoppies on motorcycles all the time, so that was kind of a... It's a monster truck stoppy, <laughs> but it was fun. Before stoppies were even a thing. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what we we're doing because we we're panicking, trying to save it. <laughs> instead, instead of trying to hold it there as long as you can, you're yeah. just like throw it, throw it. Where's it at? Um, yeah. My final fan question here is from Monster Jam Man One Two Five Zero Three. How did it feel uh, back in World Finals One doing the first ever freestyle at Sam Boyd Stadium? It was amazing. It was. It, it's funny because like back then, we, we were jumping cars, and then they would throw a van out there, and we're like, "Oh my god, how are you gonna get over top of a van?" And then a school bus, and you know, like it was. The World Finals one was so different because it was uncharted waters. Nobody's ever been that fast. Nobody's ever jumped those bigger jumps um so nobody really knew what was going to happen um or how it was going to how your truck was going to handle your body was going to handle it uh it was a it was a, it, it was an honor to be able to be part of that to be able to be the first ones there um yeah i still have my poster from all of us that we all autographed and have that in my hall of shame um yeah, it's, it was a it was a whole different experience. It was I remember standing there looking at these jumps, thinking, "What are we doing?" And now those jumps are are are, are <laughs> little speed bumps compared to the big stuff that we that we ended up doing doing now. And you went like as you said, you progressed from just a few uh, cars to 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 a van stack to a bus stack to triple bus stack. It it just kept evolving. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, over and over, and then um, you know, trying to find ways of of doing it safely and trying to make it the truck survive so you could keep on going. And uh, you know, there's nothing worse than a or more of a lonely feeling of your truck failing because um, you feel like you're so alone and you let everybody down, and that's that's a terrible feeling. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for listening. Remember, if you want to follow my social media, it's at Monster Jam Historian on Instagram, Monster Jam Historian on YouTube. You can also follow the official Monster Jam Weekly podcast page at Monster Jam Weekly underscore podcast on Instagram and Monster Jam Weekly podcast on Anchor and Spotify. Before we end off today's episode, uh, John, is there anything, anyone, whatever that you would like to um, shout out? send a message to or whatever yeah yeah i want to thank all you guys um yourself uh for doing the podcast uh the fans for the support over the years and uh all the memories and stuff man it you know thank you from the bottom of my heart you know it's you've given me a chance to live a dream and uh hopefully i get to see everybody out there again and um you know, you know, God bless you guys. Y'all be safe. But uh, thank you from the bottom of my heart for letting me live my dreams. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be there. Thank you. And I want to continue the thanking. I haven't been able to make uh, this message yet uh, in 
the speaking form yet. Uh, I want I wanted to thank you guys, uh, the listeners, for one thousand plays. I am so. So very thankful that you guys have continued to support me. I'm surprised that uh, I'm flabbergasted when I when I checked um, a couple of days ago that you guys like listening to a Aussie man talk about monster trucks for two hours. <laughs> it's 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 insane, and I and I'm so thankful that that I've been able to to <clears throat> not just um, you know, talk to people like you, John and uh, Scott, Jordan, and people like that. But but just make new friends, meet people, and just talk about Monster Jam. And uh, you guys are the reason that I keep doing these. You know, this other than that, I've wanted to do a driver interview for a while. You guys are the reason why that I, that I wanted to sit down and podcast with. You know you, John, and I'm just so very thankful that we could make this happen, and I'm even more thankful that that you guys have continued uh, continue to support me. So thank you, everyone, so very much. I I really appreciate it from the bottom of my heart, all the way from Australia. Thank you, everyone. Um, final thoughts, John? Do you just want to close uh, off? Or? Uh thanks for letting me be part. Um, thank you very much. I mean, and keep up the good work. It's I think talking to the different drivers or talking from some, uh, you get to see where it all came from and how organic it was and how real it was and how it all comes down to one main, one main thing. And that is the fans, you know, um, if it wasn't for them, we'd all have to get real jobs. Uh, you know, it was all about the fans and it would always be about the fans and, they deserve the utmost respect and love because everybody works hard for their money. And they could spend it anywhere and they would come out and see us and support us. And, um, thank you all. And thank you for doing these podcasts. I, again, thank you, John, for coming on and thank you everyone so much for listening and have a fantastic week. Goodbye guys. Jail.